This afternoon, our topic is ISIS and how it finances terrorism, and uh, that will be with a particular focus on the antiquities trade. And it's really my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Jason Blazakis, who is a professor of practice and director of the Center on Terrorism, Extremism, and Counterterrorism at the Middlebury Institute here in Monterey. Before uh, joining the staff at the Middlebury Institute, Jason was with uh, the State Department for approximately 15 years, and for the last 10 of those years, he was director of the Counterterrorism Finance and Designations Office um, at State. Uh, and previous to that, he served in a number of departments uh, including political military affairs, international narcotics, intelligence and research, and he also worked at our embassy in, in Kabul. Uh, he actually began his career with the Congressional Research Service in Washington, D.C. Um, Professor Blazakis holds two master's degrees, one from Columbia and one from the Johns Hopkins University. And we really feel very fortunate to have someone with his very rich experience and expertise uh, with us today to talk about this topic and as you can see the title of his talk is financing terror isis and antiquities jason thank you very much so i am a uh, type of person who can't stay still so i'm going to wander about if that's okay can everybody hear me just fine before I move on to the topic? It's great to be here at the uh, World Affairs Council. It's uh, an interesting topic that you signed up for. ISIS, finance, and a specific focus on ISIS and antiquities. And uh, a lot's been written in the news recently about ISIS, ISIS being defeated. And I think, hopefully, after the conversation we have today, you'll agree with me that ISIS is a group that we should still be concerned about. I think it's important to uh, always lay out an agenda. These are the nine points that I want to go over for today's conversation. And I know a lot of you are in the back and may not be able to, to see this, so I'll walk us through it. Uh, first, I think it's always important to provide context. Who comprises ISIS? What does ISIS want? Talk about that first. Second, we'll talk about where is ISIS? And a lot of ink's been devoted to the fact that ISIS has lost a significant amount of its territory. At one point in its history, in 2014 and 2015 time period, the organization had control over one-third of Iraq and one-half of Syria. Today, the organization has less than 1% of territory that it had at its zenith, but despite that fact, as we'll see, pardon? Um, as we'll see, the organization has a global footprint still. The um, next thing I want to discuss after that is how ISIS raises its funds, and then specifically delving into deeper detail about ISIS's exploitation of antiquities, not just to finance its operations, but also to destroy cultural heritage. We'll go over the scope of that impact. We'll look at some pictures. Unfortunately, these are going to be pictures of destroyed cultural heritage that provide you some context about the scope of the destruction ISIS has carried out. And then we'll talk about how ISIS has done that, both in the context of its financing, but also in the context of destroying those cultural antiquities. And at the end, I want to talk a little bit about what the U.S. government has done to try to counter ISIS's access to finance. That's the game plan. Does that sound okay to you? Yes. All right, fantastic. Only 30 more slides to go. <laughs> I'm going to be as brief as I can, particularly in this early portion, so you can ask questions, because I always find that to be the most valuable way of having a conversation, is to answer your questions, because this is about what you're interested in. I'm going to convey what I'm interested in, may not be of interest to you. So who is ISIS? First thing, ISIS is not a new organization. ISIS has been around for quite some time. In this slide, this individual on the upper hand, is an individual by the name of Abu Masab al zarqawi He is the spiritual founder of the organization. Abu Masab al zarqawi traveled to Afghanistan in 1989 in an effort to be part of the fight against uprooting the Soviets from Afghanistan. 
The problem for Zarqawi was he got there too late. The fighting was over. So he essentially filled a journalistic role reporting on what he was seeing as the Soviets were departing Afghanistan. He was, at that time also, when he went back to Jordan, perceived to be a petty criminal. He was born in 1966. He engaged in prostitutes. He engaged in theft. He wasn't a good Muslim. But he saw the light, went to Afghanistan, reformed, and then went back to the Levant, back to Jordan, in an effort to start his own group. That group was called Jund al Shah. That group wasn't particularly successful, so he created a new group, a group called the Group of Monotheism in Jihad. And I like to say that's the group that really is the first ISIS. He went back to Afghanistan in 1999 and established a camp in Afghanistan, in Herat, Afghanistan, with Osama bin Laden's permission. Bin Laden wasn't sure about Zarqawi because Zarqawi's checkered past as a criminal. So Bin Laden didn't want him to be part of the Al-Qaeda orbit, but he allowed Zarqawi to use a training ground in Herat to train his people to go back to the Levant to carry out terrorist activities. Fast forward five years to 2004, and Masab Zarqawi pledges fealty or an oath to Osama Bin Laden, and the group becomes Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Why that shift? Why that change? Why did Bin Laden change his opinion? Well, Zarqawi was being fairly successful in his terrorist operations. He assassinated the senior official for the United States Agency for International Development, an individual by Lawrence Foley's, um, was killed by Zarqawi's group in 2002. And you may, may remember the Gulf War in 2003, when Colin Powell was seeking assistance from the international community to join the United States to uproot Saddam Hussein. In Powell's speech at the United Nations, he talks about Zarqawi by name. He calls him out by name. He says, Zarqawi has links to Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein is not providing us this individual. And this individual is a person we need to get our hands on. And it's a reason why we need to go into Iraq, because there's individuals like this who are creating havoc and instability. Bin Laden heard this, heard the Secretary of State at that time talk about this individual. He saw that this individual had carried out successful attacks. So he provided Zarqawi seed money for his organization. His organization, despite its successes, didn't have a lot of money. So that's the reason why the organization then affiliated with Al-Qaeda and became Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Now, the group sustained significant damage and harm by the United States during the Second Gulf War. The organization had to go underground for a few reasons. The US had a surge in the Gulf, 30,000 plus soldiers, of um, U.S. soldiers went into Iraq to uproot this individual. And then the U.S. government worked with Sunni tribes, this is the time of the Sunni awakening, to partner up with Sunni tribes who were getting fed up with Zarqawi's philosophy. Which brings me to what does ISIS want? What ISIS wants is what Zarqawi wanted originally. Which Zarqawi's focus was to establish a global caliphate and to do it quickly and to attack, quote, unquote, the near enemy, to essentially attack heretics, individuals who did not believe in a puritanical form of Islam that Zarqawi was infatuated with. Now, Bin Laden wanted to create a caliphate, but he wanted to do it slowly, and he wanted to attack the far enemy, to attack the United States, and 9-11 is an excellent representation of Al-Qaeda's philosophy. Zarqawi wanted to kill Shia Muslims. He wanted to kill Kurds. He wanted to kill people locally so he could establish a local caliphate. Fast forward, Zarqawi is killed in 2006. The organization suffers drastic defeat. The organization becomes a covert clandestine organization living underground. Sound familiar? Because if you think about ISIS today, that's where they're heading right now. Unfortunately, in 2011, the organization was able to take advantage of the U.S. exit from Iraq Lots of reasons as to why that occurred. Happy to answer those questions you may have about that. I don't want to belabor that. And then the Syrian civil war occurs in 2012, in which this individual is about four links from Zarqawi. There's four individuals between Zarqawi and al-Baghdadi, all ineffective. But this individual, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the current head of the so-called Islamic State, as it calls itself now, is the leader of the organization who established the global caliphate, as ISIS considers it. And he announced it from the mosque in Mosul in 2014. So that's a brief history.
um, a very um, thumb not, thumbnail sketch of the genesis of the Islamic State as it exists now. And this individual, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, remains alive, still the head of the organization today. What does it want? Um, it wants to establish a global caliphate based on the um, 6th century interpretation of Muhammad's um, sayings. Uh, to go back to the time of the first four caliphs, a very puritanical form of Islam. And it wants to have that Islam spread throughout the world. Where is ISIS? I mentioned that ISIS has lost quite a bit of territory in Syria and Iraq. But it has a global footprint, as you can see from, from this map, that was made by the National Counterterrorism Center for the State Department when we announced the designation of a number of ISIS-linked organizations. ISIS has branches. It has eight formal branches spread throughout the world on Asia, Africa, and in the Middle East. It also has networks, and I'm not going to go into the distinctions between a branch and a network. If you have that question, I'd be happy to delve into it. What I want you to leave here thinking is that ISIS has got a very large footprint. It is all over, um, in a way, has its conflict spread throughout the globe. But also, more importantly, for Caliphate, you have to have territory. But to be a successful organization, you can also live virtually. I just want to leave one word here about ISIS and how effective it's been in terms of propagating its message to a worldwide audience virtually using a number of mechanisms, Twitter, Facebook, um, publishing very um, glossy magazines like Babic, um, which is the organization's magazine, and now a magazine called Ramiya. So it is a group that has an ability to convey a message to young people to inspire them to carry out attacks even though they may not be formal members of the Islamic State. So it also has a great amount of influence in that sense as well, without having territory in Iraq or Syria. So how does ISIS finance itself? This is not an exhaustive list. And when Larry and I were talking, he mentioned that there was a terrorism finance expert that came here a few years, and he was unable to specifically note how terrorists, how much money terrorists raise, and for good reason. We have ballpark numbers because quite often terrorists don't tell us how much money they raise. The Islamic State um, raised a lot of money, continues to raise a lot of money. And you see here, um, at its zenith, the group may have been accruing as much as $1 million per day by exploiting oil it had access when it had territory in Syria and Iraq. It also extorted the population that was under its thumb. There's a story I'd like to tell about Syrian and Iraqi government officials living in the Islamic State territory. They would leave the Islamic State territory to get their civil servant salaries from the government of Iraq and Syria while their family stayed behind. So they didn't make a break for it because the Islamic State had their families hostage. So they would go get their paycheck, come back, and at the ISIS checkpoint, ISIS would take about 50% of their salary. This is one of the most significant ways in which the Islamic State has financed itself. And some experts believe they may have earned more money like that than through the exploitation of natural resources like oil. The group has engaged in kidnapping for ransom. Remember the Pulp Fiction videos in which the group has beheaded U.S. journalists and nonprofit workers, but they also took advantage of kidnapping for ransom operations, according to the U.N., making anywhere between 35 to $45 million in 2014. The group received a lot of donations from wealthy donors throughout the Persian Gulf, and that was a way Al-Qaeda financed 9-11. But ISIS became the ascendant organization, so a lot of those individuals who are wealthy donors who may have been provided funds to Al-Qaeda shifted their donations to ISIS. And a report here from 2013 to 14, the UN estimate was that they were making anywhere between 30 to 40 million a year from donations alone. And the reason why you're here, antiquities. Uh, this is hard to break down with a lot of specificity. I have a, a figure up here um, that you may be able to read that the group may have made up just from one site, up to 36 million from a site in Syria known as Al Nabuk. We'll talk more about antiquity, so I'm going to skip that for now. In terms of uh, more detail, we'll provide that later. And they also benefit from various other natural resources. They had access to phosphate mines. They took a cut from agricultural products farmers were growing like wheat, and then they uh, trafficked humans. 
Um, in particular, Yazidi women, a minority sect in Iraq, you're probably familiar with this story from a few years ago, of Yazidis being held captive by the Islamic State and then coalition forces coming to rescue them. The slave market, the Islamic State engaged in and moving women in particular, the sale of those women ranged anywhere from a few dollars to a few thousand dollars, and often they would sell the women, Yazidi women, other minority women, to their foreign fighters. And last, and this is why a lot of experts believe the Islamic State is the richest terrorist group ever, is that when the group accrued territory and took over Mosul, Iraq, they actually acquired the Bank of Mosul. It had the estimate at that time in the bank was anywhere between $500 million to $1 billion. So it is a one-time cash infusion, but also a reason why I like to say the Islamic State is the richest terrorist group that I've ever come across. So how does the antiquity cycle work? And there's five steps to looting antiquities. This is a very basic representation of that process. The first step is the loot, looting it. You can dig it, or in the case of the Islamic State, which certainly occurred, you can excavate archaeological sites, and they did that. But also, think about Mosul. There was a museum in Mosul as well, and when the group took over the museum of Mosul, they had access to everything in that museum. So you can actually loot by stealing from the museum. And what happens next is that cuneiform, those coins, those silver jewelry bracelets that the group acquires need to be appraised. Local dealers in the area in Syria and Iraq will appraise those, in some cases buy them from the Islamic State. Say it's not bought, say it's shipped. Say it's shipped with an eye towards moving it overseas. The group then, a dealer will work with individuals who are smugglers who may be moving the artifacts on behalf of the Islamic State, at which point it is then moved from the smugglers to international dealers. Now, I don't know, I have a picture of Sotheby's here. I don't know if anybody has ever engaged with Sotheby's. I have no reporting that I've been able to access that is illustrative of the fact that Sotheby's has actually sold um, material antiquities that have come from ISIS-derived um, looting. But uh, in past history, large auction houses have very much often, unfortunately, sold ill-gotten antiquities that have, should have stayed in places like Egypt or elsewhere. Say it's international sells it, dealer sells it, and then the um, art, the coin, is then bought by a buyer, people like us. So one of the messages I'll leave you with later today is what we can do about ensuring that antiquities aren't um, being exploited by our own purchases. So that's the looting cycle. That's how it occurs in five steps. So what's the scope of the impact? And here's a map that was produced by the U.S. Department of State's Humanitarian Information Unit. It exemplifies the areas in which the Islamic State had territory, but also overlays of where they had access to archaeological sites or museums. So see from the next slide, they had access to 4,500 archaeological sites. They had access to dig sites in places like Al Nava, which I mentioned, that contain artifacts that were 8,000 years old. The Financial Action Task Force is a task force responsible for reporting on terrorism finance and money laundering trends, and they wrote a report about ISIS's exploitation of ISIS, uh, of antiquities that I highly recommend that you take a look at. But the bottom line was that they couldn't quantify precisely how much ISIS has made, but they could have, just from one site alone, made up to $36 million if they actually had looted the, and sold the products appropriately. Now, in the scale of antiquity trafficking, even if the organization has made hundreds of millions of dollars in a multi-year period, it's still a fairly small-scale challenge relative to the overall global challenge as it relates to the movement of illicit antiquities. Here, um, there's a note about the United Nations estimate that on a yearly basis, antiquities trafficking may impact at a $7 billion per year level. It's pretty significant. So why does ISIS avail itself of antiquities as a form of finance? And I, I think it's important to take a, a step back to think about terrorism finance writ large, that organizations that are successful organizations, whether you're a legitimate business 
or a legitimate organization, criminal or terrorist or otherwise, you have to diversify your sources of finance. There was a terrorism scholar by the name of Walter Locker, passed away last year. He said that terrorists don't live by enthusiasm alone. They also need a great deal of money. So why does ISIS engage in the movement of antiquities? It needs money. Why did it engage in the movement of oils? Why did it traffic people? Because it needed a diversified revenue stream. And for that reason, the organization was engaged in the movement of antiquities. But there are other reasons also for ISIS's work as it relates to antiquities. And that primarily is because having control over a population and destroying civilizations that they're perceived to be anathema to your own worldview was one reason why the Islamic State engaged in the destruction of antiquities. You'll remember a few years ago probably seeing on the nightly news, maybe PBS NewsHour, the destruction of a very ancient site in Palmyra. Why did the group do that? To exert control over a population, to erase civilization, to erase a civilization that was anathema to its own worldview. It also did it to recruit individuals. By destroying these civilizations, it's able to send a message out to prospective recruits that we're the kind of organization you may want to join because we won't tolerate other cultures. And that has an appeal to people that may be thinking about joining a group like the Islamic State. The widespread destruction also of shrines, of Roman history, occurred because from a Iraqi government official perspective, it was a cover. It wanted to make people think that the group may not be benefiting from the sale of antiquity. So it would destroy larger columns, that columns that would be hard to sell, for instance, Corinthian Roman columns, but sell the smaller products, the coins, the Bibles, the cuneiform. So it was a cover, it was a ruse to try to distract people from this source of finance. The regime and rebel forces to include groups like ISIS, but other groups like Jabhat al-Nusra. But I, I have this here just to, I think it really is a stark example of what's occurred in the context of the conflict in Syria and the effect it's had on civilization. Here you have another um, <coughs> geospatial image, this one provided by Digital Globe in 2012, that is an example of a site in Apamea, Syria, which was controlled by the Islamic State. These are Roman ruins. On the left-hand side of the screen, you have the before picture. On the right-hand side of the screen, you have the after. You have the very famous colonnade of Apamea right here, before picture. You see all the columns. After, all the columns have been destroyed. Another example of the Islamic State trying to erase civilization history, and in this case, it was Roman <coughs> history. So, I think the most interesting slides are the next seven slides. And I, I say that because when you think about why a group raises finance or how a group raises finance and what its structure is to raise money, specifically what the group is doing to exploit antiquities, the Islamic State is, is fairly unique in the sense that as you see here, they actually had an org chart for it. And the next seven documents are derived from a raid that occurred in May of 2015, a raid against an individual um, named Abu Sayyaf al-Iraqi. And in that raid, U.S. Special Forces uncovered these next seven documents. These documents um, were documents obviously at one point classified, but were declassified in 2015 and used by Secretary of State Kerry, one example, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art to display to the audience the scope and systematic way ISIS was exploiting antiquities. So what you see here in this work chart is the word Dewan. It may be hard to read even if you're close. So a Dewan is the equivalent of a department. So what you have here is the Dewan for natural resources. And underneath of that Dewan, you have the antiquities division. Underneath the Antiquities Division, it's broken down geographically with Eastern and Western governance. And this is the Arabic. It's actually an Arabic and it's been translated. And underneath of the Western and Eastern governance, you have various divisions. You have a marketing division, you have an excavation division, you have an administration division, and you have a research and investigative division. So the group was very bureaucratic in its effort to try to exploit antiquities. Now the next couple of charts I find really fascinating because it's an example of correspondence between individuals within the Islamic State, but also it's an example of human resources 
And I don't know if you remember receiving performance appraisals. I certainly do when I was a government employee. And essentially what you have here is that performance appraisal and an actual hiring and firing decision. So this letter, we're not sure who it comes from, but it's a high-ranking ISIS official. The Arabic is indecipherable, so we're not sure precisely who it is. But the letter is being written to a guy named Haji Hamid. Haji Hamid was the head of the Dewan for Natural Resources. So he was the equivalent of, say, a head of a department, say, like the Department of um, Interior, for instance. Essentially, this letter being sent to Haji Hamid is telling him that there needs to be a new person at the head of the Antiquities Division, and his name is Abu Sayyaf al-Iraqi. And it, he says he needs to be the head of the division because he has the appropriate skill set to run the division. He knows about antiquities, and he knows how to run and manage an office. And here, you probably can't see it very easily, but the letter also says, fire Abu Jihad al-Tanisi because he is a simpleton who can't manage the division. So, it's very interesting in telling that the Islamic State is actually engaged in letter writing that <laughs> reflect their perspective on individuals' capabilities as it relates to the exploitation of antiquities and who could do the job. And you see Haji Hamid's response saying, um, got the order, um, Abu Sayyaf al-Iraqi, he is going to be the head, just as you say. So Hamid is agreeing that um, to the hiring decision. So what you have here is an actual document, again, um, it's hard, you can't see the Arabic very well because of the light, but essentially it's a license to loot being signed off on by Abu Sayyaf al-Iraqi, giving permission to somebody for 16 months to carry out excavation activities. So it's essentially permission, a permission slip. If you want to build a fence in your backyard and you would need say, permission from the city of Monterey, this is the equivalent to that. ISIS is giving permission to have this individual dig. In the next couple slides are actual receipt book slides. Um, ISIS actually documented all the pilfering that was going on so they could take a portion of it. For everything looted, and you'll see the next two receipt books, the organization took 20% of what was looted. So that's how they benefited from the uh, looting of antiquities in the first instance. And here you see um, Abu Sayyaf al-Iraqi is signing off on the receipt book the fact that he received over 2,960,000 Syrian pounds. Sounds like a lot of money. I, I looked at the conversions recently. That's probably no more than a ten to $15,000, but those add up. Um, and here's another example. This one slightly less, uh, 2.1 million Syrian pounds. Again, all the paperwork with an official seal and stamp. So very bureaucratic, organized fashion, ISIS was allowing for the exploitation of antiquities. And here you have um, the ISIS purchase list, and you have seven items here documented, things that were sold ranging from bracelets to gold and silver lira. And here you have the purchase value. It was sold at, for instance, number seven silver and gold lira, 14 um, gold lira, 76 silver lira, sold for the equivalent of approximately $40,000, and ISIS's take of that was $8,000, and that's also noted here. Again, another really good example of a systematic way ISIS was keeping track of its financing. So, I have a movie sometimes I play, but I'm going to skip it. This is the actual movie of the raid itself of um, Abu Sayyaf that occurred by U.S. Special Forces in eastern Syria in May of 2015. All those documents came because of this raid. Um, they captured cell phones, they captured files, they actually had um, recovered a Bible and some coins that were in the possession of Abu Sayyaf, I believe cuneiform as well. So it was illustrative of the fact that Abu Sayyaf kept some of these products um, to himself, probably with an eye towards selling them. So what can the U.S. government, I should say, taking a step back, what can the U.S. government do about countering ISIS access to antiquities? That was an example. The raid against Abu Sayyaf was a kinetic example of dealing with the problem. Now, it's harder to use kinetic activities, violent activities, against the antiquity challenge, say, as opposed to bombing oil wells, for instance, that may have been in the hands of the Islamic State. And that's what the U.S. government did in an effort to counter the 
exploitation of oil by the Islamic State. They bombed in 2015 oil refineries, oil wellheads that were in the possession of the Islamic State. And that was, in many ways, a shift. A shift in the way the U.S. government took against countering ISIS's finance. And one of the reasons, perhaps most successfully, why the U.S. was able to succeed in countering the Islamic State's finance is because it was destroying these wells. That was a really hard decision to make. I was at the State Department at that time while we were debating this. The challenge was the group is accruing a lot of finance on the one hand, but at some point the Islamic State is going to be uprooted from Syria and Iraq and you're destroying critical infrastructure that can help build, rebuild the countries of Iraq and Syria. So it, that was why it took quite some time to come to that conclusion that the U.S. and coalition forces should bomb oil wells because it was going to have a, a deleterious effect on the future of Syria and Iraq. Who is going to end up paying for that? The United States? I'm not so sure right now in the current political climate that the U.S. would. It seems like Saudi Arabia is maybe stepping up to the plate. Um, but the, the bottom line is bombing antiquities um, to stop ISIS from moving those antiquities is a non-starter. You're not going to destroy cultural heritage. And in many cases, the Islamic State was pretty savvy to this, and they would often bend down at these cultural sites, knowing that the U.S. government and the coalition wouldn't bomb those sites. So um, it was something that the Islamic State was well aware of, that reticence to destroy antiquities for good reason. What else could be done to counter a group's access to antiquities? You can build capacity. And this slide I have on the left-hand side, people that are involved in the art world, people who are cleaning, restoring art. On the right-hand side, I have an example of the National Security Community, and in between, I have this brick wall. And essentially, what, what hap has to happen to be able to really assist in trying to stop the movement of antiquities is to have these worlds work together, to have the art world work with the National Security Committee. And how easy do you think that is? <laughs> really hard. But we gave it an effort in my office at the State Department to try to have the art world and the national security world come together. And what we did was we put out a notice of funding opportunity for a couple hundred thousand dollars seeking a group of experts to come together to bid on a proposal to help us understand the illicit trade routes that the Islamic State was using to help us put together training materials that we could use for capacity building training sessions with foreign interlocutors. And the winner of that bid was George Mason University because they had this unique mixture of national security experts and art experts on a team that put together a really strong proposal that now is only being pushed out to the field and being used in places like Turkey that could help hopefully with their understanding of the challenges as it relates to the movement of illicit antiquities. The last thing I want to mention, because I think we almost have 30 minutes, we're a little over, wow, I'm talking your ear off, I'm sorry. Um, the State Department put together a Rewards for Justice program. Now historically, the Rewards for Justice program has been focusing on soliciting or eliciting information about individuals who carried out specific acts of terrorism. To give you one example, there was a $25 million reward for Osama bin Laden. Not often did we use, very seldom did we use, in fact, this mechanism for thematic issues. So we felt that it was time to think about broadening the aperture to use a reward for justice program to try to get information and fidelity about the networks being used by ISIS in the context of moving oil and antiquities. So we put out and advertised a reward program trying to find those individuals that were involved in the movement of antiquities. Up to $5 million sources can provide information that will give us better fidelity as to whether or not the organization has specific individuals who are moving those products on behalf of ISIS so we can get our hands on them and prosecute them. Now I don't have it on the slide, um, but the U.S. government can also prosecute individuals who are engaged in movement of antiquities on behalf of foreign terrorist organizations like the Islamic State. That's not occurred, but in 2012, with a prosecution that was contemplated for 2017, what happened instead was um, a negotiated agreement with an organization called the Hobby Lobby. Have you ever heard of them? <laughs> so they had a lot of um, material, mostly cuneiform, and um, 
seal tablets um, with the seals of, say, Roman um, seals that they had in their possession illegally that was out of the ground, scooped out of the ground in Syria. And they were fined $3 million. So the U.S. government can levy fines on organizations that may be peddling things illegally. And the one thing I will say in the context of the challenge as it relates to um, buying antiquities or thinking about buying antiquities is I, I think you probably are the type of folks who would actually consider buying beautiful artwork um, not often, you know, I often speak with students who are in their 20s or 30s, they're, they're not at all thinking about buying beautiful art. But you, you are, you're in that, that, that spot in life where you can afford that. Um, what I would ask you to do is to consider some of the things I talked about, to visit the red list put out by the International Council of Museums, ICOM. They put out what has likely been out and exploited by groups like the Islamic State that may be out on the market before you actually purchase something, that you also understand the provenance, the origins of that art that you might be thinking about buying. And, and there are probably a lot of still unfortunately shady, very shady buyers. Um, my wife and I used to live in Virginia, and we used to buy products from a place in Middleburg, Virginia, beautiful horse country. And um, that place where we bought some things from, um, thankfully we know we didn't buy anything that was illicit because I know better. But there was a raid on that individual store because he was importing things like ivory illegally. So I, I want you to be careful about where you buy your products. To try to understand the origins as best you can, the provenance of the products you buy, because that is one of the very best ways to deter individuals who are engaged in illicit trafficking. And this last slide is essentially a slide that shows the kinds of things that can be done to fight terrorism. And I already went through a few of them, ranging from violent kinetic activity to doing things that are on the softer side. I have DeMarsh's list, which is essentially important um, that the U.S. Embassy will go into a country, ask another country to do something that the U.S. policymakers want to have done in that country, um, and everything in between. And I talked about quite of those things already. So I'm at 35 minutes, I believe. So I'd love to open up the floor with questions to hear your perspective and hopefully uh, continue the conversation. I'm going to pass around this mic, because um, that's the instruction Judy's given me. Um, so if you have a question, I'm going to hand you this mic. Let's talk about the Hobby Lobby court case. Well, it, it ended up not going in court. Um, it was settled. Um, and the Hobby Lobby had to pay a $3 million fine because they were um, engaged in bringing over from the UAE and from Israel um, illegal products that shouldn't have been excavated out of the ground in Syria. So it was a negotiated agreement. There was no um, firm evidence also that the Hobby Lobby knew, for instance, that the products they may be selling could have been somehow benefiting the Islamic State. So there was no direct correlation between the products that they had and a direct link to the Islamic State. If we go back to a few slides, for instance, in the antiquity cycle, it's very likely where the Islamic State makes its money is in the first two areas. I had the example of the receipt books. Um, essentially, people are paying for a license to loot. And then people who are perhaps selling the products locally are provided 20% of the funds to the Islamic State. You know, quite often when there's a significant conflict, antiquities don't make the larger market until five to ten years later. So a lot of the things that may be held by the Islamic State perhaps for a rainy day that didn't move, say, past the local dealer level, could be things that they're sitting on right now to sell later. But the Hobby Lobby was not one of those organizations that wittingly or knowingly were selling things that could have benefited the Islamic State. That's part of the reason why the U.S. negotiated a plea agreement with them. Okay. All right, that sounds good. Thank you, Judy. Any other questions? Yes. What, what is the um, prospect of restitution? <coughs> yeah, I, I think that the, the process of restitution, essentially, um, if something is discovered that may be of, say, Syrian origin, given the, the current conflict between the United States, this lack of simpatico between the United States and the Assad regime, that immediate restitution is less likely to occur. It's already occurring with the government of Iraq, though, where we've seen things that have actually um, hit the markets, have been known to be 
um, things that shouldn't have come out of the ground in Iraq have been sent back to Iraq. So with Iraq, it's going to be easier. With Syria, it's going to be much more difficult. Great question. Yes? Can you uh, give a sense of how many people are now involved in the range of support? Okay. Uh, is how much is the money kept? I mean, we're talking about you know, 200 million, 500 to a billion dollars floating around here. It's not a bank. So the great question, the question is, how large are these various branches and affiliates first? And they vary in size significantly. The Algeria branch, for instance, um, originally known as Jandar Khalifa Algeria, probably has no more than 15 to 20 individuals in it. The Algerian government services are actually quite strong in countering the organization, uh, whereas, say, a good counterexample may be ISIS in West Africa, where you're talking multiple hundreds of individuals to potentially thousands in size. So the, the, the scope is quite large in terms of variance. In terms of how does the Islamic State keep its money? Um, fundamentally, how do terrorist groups keep their money? Um, and they can do this in various number of ways. The Islamic State um, has used the formal financial system. So uh, the first thing I want to say is groups can move money around a number of ways, through informal or formal means. And the Islamic State has actually used the formal financial system, and the U.S. government actually has assets of the Islamic State frozen in the United States. Small amounts, so mostly not using the formal financial system, but the group will use informal means. Um, means like um, hawalas, for instance, to transfer money um, informally. But the group very likely is using cash couriers and moving people through trusted magnet. That's probably the most likely way in which the group is moving money. And where the group is keeping money, it's very likely that they are keeping the money in safe houses, they're keeping the money in remote areas, so that's where they're storing the money. They're not storing the money quite often in financial institutions. Great question. Um, very much a seminar kind of level question, so uh, we can go into a lot more detail. They're using a diverse amount of methods not just to raise money, but also to move money and to store money. Lots of questions. Yes, sir. We'll work our way towards the back. We hear that there's a lot of unemployment of young men in most of the Middle Eastern countries. And what is driving those people into ISIS as an organization? Okay, so the question is, um, we have a, a statement that there's a lot of un unemployment in many places in which the Islamic State operates. And the question also is, what are the push-pull factors that may motivate or animate an individual to join a group like the Islamic State? And, and the answer is, is not clear-cut. There are, are different motivations for different individuals. Um, there is a, a time-honored um, tradition amongst academics, by and large, to say that social economic issues, structural issues, are not the primary drivers for individuals to join groups like the Islamic State. So it's, it's not the lack of economic opportunity, but I would say that for certain individuals that may be the case, but quite often you'll see individuals motivated by familial connections. Um, you'll have individuals that may be motivated by um, this, a need to be part of some kind of in-group. The organization was seen as a group that perhaps this person who was in an out-group of society where they may be living may not have influence, they may not have an impact, they may feel like they're less than other people, and they feel like perhaps the Islamic State could be their in-group. Um, so I think they may be suffering in some, some fashion, um, so that could be another reason. Um, there, there are a host, a myriad of reasons as to why an individual. Some of them could be economic, some of them will be personality based. Some of them will be um, based on the fact that you had a lot of formal criminals join the group like the Islamic State, people who are nihilist, people who want to carry out violence for the sake of violence. There is an individual in my office sanctioned um, pursuant to the Secretary of State's legal authorities, a guy named Dennis Kusper, aka Deso Dog, he's a former rapper in Germany toward the United States with a rap group called DMX. You know, he was an individual that had nihilistic tendencies. He wanted to go join the Islamic State because he wanted to kill people. You, know, you can go by person by person um, as to why. Some of them generally probably wanted to join uh, an Islamic caliphate, to have a caliphate to go back to the times of Muhammad and the first four caliphs, and that could be their motivating factor. So it varies. It's a great question. So you, sir? Can you give an example of how they move oil from the wellhead to trucks? They use yeah, trucks. Oh, absolutely. Big tankers. Where is Khorasan? 
Khorasan is in Afghanistan and Pakistan. It's one of the most dangerous of the ISIS affiliates. Uh, so when the U.S. government made the decision to start bombing ISIS, one of the big decisions was to bomb the actual tanker trucks that were moving the product to Turkey. And the hard issue there for the U.S. policymaker was a lot of those individuals who actually owned the rigs were not members of the Islamic State. They had those rigs because they were engaged perhaps in legitimate business activities before the Islamic State took over that territory. So what the U.S. government did, and I have another PowerPoint slide that I've given before, where it actually shows the leaflets that were being dropped before the bombings occurred, saying, you might want to leave your truck now and run because we're about to bomb you. So that's what the U.S. government did, is they actually bombed tanker trucks. Sir? Speaking generically, Western museums and universities resist One of their arguments, they say, uh, maybe the origin was a bit murky, but our source was a reliable source. So don't hold us accountable for what happened in the ground. And secondly, we take much better care of these coins and tablets and then this terrible country uh, where they came from. In your work with ISIS, did you encounter these particular arguments to resist the turning and no, I, I have not witnessed that, but I've seen this in the context of other cases in which places like the Getty Museum may have very famous things that have been scooped out of the ground in places like Greece, for instance, and they've been reticent about returning them because the perspective that they can take better care of the, say, urn than the government of Greece, and they would say, well, we felt that the provenance was legitimate. And then you get into admired in, in court cases, and the U.S. government may interject at some point upon completion of any kind of legal challenge to help take the product back, but it's a very common phenomenon. I have not seen it in the context of ISIS yet, though. It's a great question. Yes, sir. Let's, I, I don't want to just look at the, the right side of the room, so. On your list, why is Indonesia, Malaysia, and Pakistan not included? Is there a reason that they don't choose those countries? In the, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Pakistan? Yes. So ISIS Khorasan is the uh, ISIS outfit in Pakistan. So it's a group that spans both Afghanistan and Pakistan. They call themselves Khorasan. It's, a, it's an old name for the region. Um, Indonesia and Malaysia, what I've seen primarily as it relates to individuals from Indonesia and Malaysia, they have been part of the ISIS Philippines organization. In fact, most of the leadership figures, at least early on before they were all killed, um, were from Malaysia. Yes, sir. It doesn't show any affiliates in Russia or China. And I thought I just heard in the news recently where the Chinese and the Russians uh, ran out some Muslim people. So the, the question is, this map doesn't necessarily reflect, um, and it's going to be hard to see because it's a small map, um, the presence of ISIS in places like Russia and China. The uh, affiliate in the Caucasus region is actually the presence ISIS has in Russia. Um, and you'll see this little dot here. That's Russia right there. So they do have a presence in Russia. They, they don't have a significant presence in China. And I think what the gentleman was referring to about the challenge as it relates to um, the Chinese perception of um, problematic Islamic actors in China is a reflection of the Chinese government saying that there is an organization called the East Turkestan Islamic Movement, or ETIM, that the government of China has branded as a, a terrorist organization, an organization primarily comprised of of ethnic Uyghurs, but there are some Arabs as part of that organization as well. Um, I would say that it's been my experience, because I had direct experience working with the Chinese government on the issue as it relates to East Turkestan Islamic movement, um, is because they actually asked us to designate that organization as a foreign terrorist organization, as an FTO. And there was a great amount of reticence um, in the last past few years to do that, because what we see with China, unfortunately, is if you were to give them this extra leverage as it relates to deeming this entire movement of individuals as terrorists, and not all the Uyghurs are terrorists, but China has this tendency to label and conflate all Uyghurs as terrorists, you may give them leverage to even crack down further against this ethnic minority that may not be perhaps individuals engaged in terrorist activity. So we had a lot of concern about actually um, adhering to some of the Chinese requests as it relates to sanctioning ETEN. And not to get into too many levels of um, splitting this issue, but there are other in organizations that share the name. 
there are actual organizations. So in, in many ways, most experts don't look at ETIM as a terrorist group. Um, it's a way for the Chinese to label all Uyghurs as terrorists. There's organizations called, for instance, the East Turkestan Islamic Party, which is different from ETIM. Um, that's an organization that actually exists. It's an organization that actually is fighting in places like Syria and have a close connection with jihadist groups in Syria, but not ISIS. They have a closer connection to a group called Jabhat al-Nusra. So uh, that's some of the context as it relates to China. Um, not seen a, a significant China link with ISIS yet. Yes, sir, with the hat. Uh, looking at the things you've talked about, the, the need for money, how they generate the money, a little bit how they use the money. Could you compare the situation a few years ago when there was a functioning caliphate and they actually were running communities and providing services compared to now when they're not doing any of that? It's a great question. So one of the reasons why terrorists need money, to kind of go back to the Walter Locker quote, they don't need money just for operations. And in fact, operations for terrorist groups tend to be fairly inexpensive. 9-11 is an outlier, costs anywhere between $400,000 to $500,000 to carry off. The Islamic State's November 13, 2015 attack in Paris, France, cost approximately $72,000. What the Islamic State needed money for was to govern. You're absolutely right. They need a lot of money to govern. They need to provide education services, health services, sanitation services. They acted as a proto-state. They needed money to pay their foreign terror fighters. When the Islamic State started losing access to its revenue streams, we saw that foreign terror fighters were being paid half of what they had been paid previously in 2014 and 2015. So the question is a great question. The question is, the Islamic State needed a lot of money for a lot of things before, but what do they need money for now? And I argue that the Islamic State needs the money for a period in time in which the U.S. government and other coalition factors forget about the Islamic State. So when they pop out of the ground like they did, and in 2011, after being largely defeated, they have actually money to sustain the operation for the future. So I look at what they have right now as a rainy day fund, but I also see it as a way for them to remain relevant with their various affiliates. If you look at this map, you know, these affiliates, very likely, um, and now I'm not in the government anymore, I can't really provide specificity on this, but it's very likely that some of the money from the ISIS core group in Syria and Iraq might be going to these various branches and networks that exist elsewhere in an effort to help them um, continue the momentum the organization created in Syria and Iraq. It's a great question. Yes, sir. And then the uh, woman behind you. You mentioned uh, religious idealism. How does uh, the uh, caliphate or ISIS function uh, relative to religious idealism? If you even go as far as the lobbies and, and how they are very dominant in Saudi Arabia as a, a religious background to the organization. Yeah, I mean, it's a, an organization that adheres to the Wahhabi form of, of Islam. So, very much so, the organization um, has tried to create in Syria and Iraq when they had the territory uh, a, a, a time and place in which people live like the Prophet Muhammad lives. Um, and following his saying, following the um, Quran, the organization, I from my perspective, tried to uphold those ideals as best they, they perceived it. Uh, I would say there are going to be a lot of people, um, scholars of Islam, who said that it's a gross distortion, um, and I agree with that perspective, but from the Islamic State's mindset, they were adhering to a strict form of Wahhabi Islam. So I, I think from their perspective, absolutely, they were adhering to that. What does Daesh mean? Daesh, so I should have said in the context of the the conversation. It's, the, it's essentially the, the Arabic acronym for ISIS, so the equivalent of what the Islamic State is. Now, the U.S. government during the Obama administration liked to use Daesh as a way to refer to the Islamic State because it has this pejorative tone um, in Arabic when it's pronounced. So, essentially, um, with, uh, say, essentially the equivalent of being like a jackass or a donkey. Um, so, the Islamic State hated being referred to as Daesh. Um, that's why policymakers during the Obama administration want to refer to it that way because it was a pejorative way. When you're trying to work with coalition partners overseas, it's a great way to, to share a conversation that it's not an Islamic state, it's a false Islamic state, it's Daesh instead. So it was a way to um, you know, push a, a, a kind of propaganda message, if that makes sense. Yes? Um, these um, individuals who are giving money to uh, ISIS, are they still doing so? I assume these are uh, very wealthy Sunni. 
people from uh, um, Saudi Arabia and the neighboring states. And I'm wondering if the uh, ISIS bureaucracy, are these uh, Saddam Hussein people who were bureaucrats in Saddam Hussein's government? So, great question. We're still uh, Sunnis also. The, the second question, I'm going to address that one first, is um, the influence of former Saddam Hussein members within the Islamic State and whether or not that had any influence in the way the group operated in a very bureaucratic fashion. So the first answer is the Islamic State most certainly had individuals within the Saddam Hussein regime as part of the organization. And they were very influential individuals that had military and intelligence background um, individuals that allowed for the Islamic State to be a pretty effective fighting force early on when it was kicking on Iraqi security forces. So the answer is yes. Now, the question is whether or not they were a reason why they were bureaucratic, and the answer there is, I, I think, no. I think the organization always had, had a tendency, even when it was Al-Qaeda in Iraq, to document everything. There's a 2010 RAND study, it's a think tank, that did a good exploration of how the Al-Qaeda in Iraq operated in the Anbar province in 2008 to 2010, and the organization was really good about keeping notes and keeping track of receipts. And there's also a book I would recommend if you're interested in bureaucracy and terrorism written by Jacob Shapiro from Princeton University that talks about this very issue. It's called The Terrorist Dilemma. So the group has um, a historic past of being bureaucratized, not necessarily a connection to Hussein per se. The first question was whether or not... But were there so Oh, yes, yes. Predominantly Sunni organization, absolutely. And then the second question, or some of the Ba'athists within the Hussein regime, but then becoming more um, religiously inclined, so moving away from sort of being the Hussein regime being a Ba'athist regime organization, then moving to Sunni. Now, the first question was whether or not the Islamic State is still making money from wealthy donors. Uh, I, my answer to that is I am not 100% certain as to whether or not they are. I think they are. I think they're accruing finance from wealthy donors in different ways than they used to. They used to be very much transparent about raising funds over social media and Facebook, but they moved to more closed apparatus and platforms to raise money through wealthy donors. And that's hard to have insight into if they're using Telegram as opposed to crowdsourcing through Twitter for their financing. So the answer is I think they are. I'm not 100% certain. Let's move to this side of the room, because I'm being biased to this side. Yes, sir. What about Erdogan and, and Turkey? Ah. Well, how do they fit in? That's a great question. Uh, and I am not an Erdogan or um, geopolitical expert. I have my opinion. Um, it's probably worth that, just as an opinion. So my perception of what's going on on the ground is if the U.S. pulls out from Syria, which it seems like there's some reticence about a complete pullout of the 2,500 soldiers that Trump administration had mentioned that there would be a pullout in December. Bolton's kind of walked that back, really upset Erdogan a lot when he came back. Um, Erdogan wouldn't meet him. I think Turkey's best interest is still, first and foremost, to counter the Kurds. I don't think Turkey's invested in countering the Islamic State. Second, I think the you think you asked about Russia as well. Uh, Russia's primary interest, from my perspective, and I'm a novice in this area in terms of geopolitical issues, is that Russia cares first and foremost about the um, Assad regime remaining in power. And they care about that because they have warm weather um, seaports that they have access to that's very important for Russian naval interests. So Russia's primary interest will be not fighting the Islamic State, even though they're really good at saying that they do, um, they really aren't. And their primary interest is propping up the Assad regime. That's my perspective on that. Um, I saw another hand up over here. Last question. Yes, sir. Did you have that slide up there? Can you explain the difference between branches and networks? All right, I thought the one would ask that question. I'm very happy that you have. So it's, uh, it's, it's really, I have to say, it's a distinction without a difference. So ISIS has declared eight branches, or wilaya, or provinces. And essentially you have an individual, say, that's part of the ISIS caucus province, the leader of ISIS caucus province, has pledged an oath to the leader of the Islamic State. In this context, Abu uh, Bakr al-Baghdadi. And then Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi accepted that pledge. So then there, a formal link between the organizations because there was an oath, and that oath was accepted. Um, all these branches were largely created pre-2015. 
All these networks generally happen post-2015. These individuals that are heads of these networks pledged their oath, but Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi did not accept the oath. The reason why, from my perspective, and this is just uh, informed speculation, I don't have anything to back this up, that al-Baghdadi was concerned about the intense terrorism, counterterrorism pressure being placed on groups that had had their pledge accepted, and perhaps there would be less pressure on these various entities if they did not have their pledge accepted. So I think he made a strategic decision to back away from this concept of having these formal walayas. And in essence, I, I say it really doesn't matter whether or not it's a branch or a network. Some of the networks, quite frankly, are as effective or more effective than some of the branches, for what it's worth. It's a great question. Thank you for asking it.